Hi friends, welcome again to Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. It is amazing that I get to meet all kinds of people. And I met Dr. Debrag Banerjee fairly recently at our first AI with Jai Summit, which was an unconference in Carmel by the Sea. Debrag is a very unassuming, but very interesting person. Debrag, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, thank you, uh, Shankar, for inviting me to your forum. So, hello, everybody. I'm Debrag. Um, uh, my journey with AI started by now all slightly more than 30 years ago. First paper, I think, if I remember, I, I, I published in the transactions that was, you know, way back when I was still a student in I already Karakur uh, was in 1993. And my journey in this you know, wonderful world of algorithms and AI and machine learning and information theory started from way back then. And I am uh, uh, I am very um, uh, grateful that I can uh, still, uh, still keep going. So I was uh, fortunate to have uh, uh, been part of this, you know, uh, big revolution in um, in the in the early days of um, wireless communication when things went from two G to three G to four G, and uh, you know uh, the big aha of uh, when we realized that with multiple antennas we can actually transmit faster. What's called MIMO. Uh, we, we was actually born in the uh, in the same lab I was doing my PhD at in Stanford, and I was fortunate to have. Uh, uh, seen it take over the world. Uh, I still remember um, uh, for a while I took this expat gig to uh, set up uh, what at that time was the world's biggest uh, 4G network that broke uh, so many firsts. It was called Geo. Uh, it went from zero to 170 million customers in uh, like about seven months or so uh, until ChatGPT, that was the fastest acquisition of customers, paying customers for a new product. Uh, and in between, I had uh, built two startups. Um, uh, one was Avnera, where uh, the spark of an idea that I had when taking uh, the information theory uh, classes uh, back in Stanford that, hey, um, why do you think of joint source channel coding as having a particle ceiling? Uh, it can probably be uh, not really a ceiling if we if we consider things like uh, feedback based uh, coding and all that and uh, and that led to uh, led to this company uh, we went to market as a as a chipset actually it was a it was a single uh, chip SOC um, that made uh, it possible to have uh, uncompressed high quality essentially uninterruptible real-time audio that you know people today can experience um in a whole home wireless audio setting uh going over um totally unlicensed 2.4 gear band um and then uh, after a while at intel where uh i did my little part in trying to get intel into um into low power um, designs um, for handheld devices uh, uh, with WiMAX, uh, uh, must say. Uh, uh, I then took to the took a similar concept and brought it into into the world of um, of video over uh, like this type of real time video conversations over the um, over any kinds of network, uh, and that uh, led to second my second start of YPU. In between, uh, I've been in the machine learning, uh, DSP, uh, uh, and AI algorithm spaces in companies as diverse as uh, Philips, Texas, when Geo, I first took I took my first step out of the you know familiar bounds of um, of information theory and and telecom and and went into the uh, went into the world of e-commerce. Actually, uh, my first generative AI based product was in uh, in using it using GANs specifically to uh, to build this um, uh, fashion designs uh, for t-shirts and tops and all the things for a fashion e-commerce company that uh, that then got uh, acquired by Walmart, um, a company called Mintra at the time. And then uh, I, I I moved on to 
things like helping uh, companies to better AI. Like, for example, a music streaming company, they wanted to figure out what ad to place after music, and music is unstructured. How do you understand what is so obvious to human ears that, oh, this music is similar to that? What's the best way to utilize that or for, for a patient to understand that? With deep learning and to and, and place the right ads, if I recall it right, their CDR went down by two x uh, in one single A/B experiment. Uh, also, within in 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 the travel space, where um, at uh, at Agoda, a Asia Pacific brand for uh, for the booking holdings group, um, uh, the biggest online travel agency out there. Um, uh, uh, I helped them crack uh, into getting their uh, their fundamental arbitrage with their on pricing or marketing or understanding which hotels are worth staying and you know how how to have chatbots and customer service work right. Uh, and since then, I have been trying to take this to the to the world in the in the form of Mission Animus. This is. Uh, this is my company with the sole mission of AI done right. AI is a power, powerful tool, and it can bring tremendous amount of good to the world. But the, how we pose the problems in the right way and with the right formulation can make the difference between harnessing that and you know growing the bottom line and top line of uh, enterprises of all sizes versus not. And that's my mission today. So Devrag, I don't even know where to start. You're talking about 2G, 3G, 4G, chip design, which is my forte a long time ago, and uh, Avnera, analog mixed signal interfaces of all kinds. You worked on chips, you worked on systems, DSP chips, you worked on fashion design, you worked on uh, travel, all kinds of things. How did you manage to be excel in all these areas? Right. So uh, I, I don't claim myself to be an expert in all of these areas, right? So my specialty lies in um, being able to understand the problems they are facing in a form that is amenable to the right type of algorithmic solution that, that helps crack the problem. And, and in many ways, um, if you look at, at the very fundamentals of how algorithmic systems work, there are certain fundamental rules of information theory that actually ties everything together. And so whether you're looking at you know, bits coming across the wide world of, of radio frequency or a set of orders coming over an internet e-commerce or a, a big, large corpus of uh, multi petabytes of data churning through thousands of GPUs with trillions of transistors in each. Ultimately, uh, it all boils down to how best you understand the the fundamental nature of these processes. How do you model them? And how do you actually uh, apply the rules of um, of of machine learning AI to uh, to get the maximum um, benefit that you are trying to achieve out of it. That specific thing is my forte. And it just happens to be something that I can apply to pretty much any systemic problems that or any any application areas that are amenable to solutions that, of this nature. In fact, uh, there is a real problem that many of the people in my audience face, and I face it too which is there's tremendous pressure now on using generative AI, especially in large public companies, whether it's Coca-Cola mm -hmm. or Salesforce, there's tremendous pressure coming from customers, from their board, somehow use large language model, somehow make life easier. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for them? I mean, otherwise it'll be all meaningless if they just put it as a buzzword. Right, so so I do uh, believe that generative AI is, uh is way more powerful than just buzzword. And, and I do it with some uh, some evidence. Uh, recently, a major network equipment uh, maker, um, a big multi-billion dollar uh, public credit one, 
um, retained uh, me for uh, designing their chatbot systems with a mix of uh, factor databases as well as LLMs. Uh, at first, with uh, you know, public LLMs from OpenAI and Azure, but also uh, going into in, in the future um, uh, more fine tuned versions uh, that are amenable to their uh, field. And uh, having actually you know helped them build the system, we did find that they could sell, save um, around fifty percent of their uh products of a customer support um calls and as a result you know real money uh, and that's that that's independent from how quickly those problems are solved at the end of their their customers i mean imagine uh, you have a critical network error and imagine that the enterprise is is losing money every minute uh, so it does make a big difference whether whether, whether uh the people troubleshooting it um uh, trying to look up the solution through millions of pages of documentation can do it within 10 seconds and they have an answer in front of them or whether they have to be um, you know pouring through documents and talking to people over the phone over perhaps a day um so generative ai has huge potential for enterprises and for people's lives and and it is it is a force that uh, we need to uh, develop better tools for. We need to develop better use cases for. We need to make sure that we also have the right way to benchmark them, to understand how to measure that the accuracy of their answers, the usefulness of their answers, those two being slightly different things. Uh, and by the way, um, you know, one of the things I'm uh, I'm in the process of developing is in, along those lines of accuracy and uh and usefulness uh page works but it is it is not a buzzword it is a fundamental shift uh that if harnessed the right way can sort of a tagline ai does right it has a tremendous potential for improving productivity across the board um truly across the board well thank you that is very important to know that AI has to be done responsibly ethically and done right. I mean, you can't just slap it in or throw some prompts. There's much mm -hmm. more work to do. You worked on Geo, and I guess you're one of the early architects at Geo to build mm -hmm. that vast network. When mm -hmm. I first saw Geo, I thought it was a joke. I was already in India. I was traveling through India in 2016 when Geo said they'll give first six months free, but they went from literally zero to be hundreds of millions of people using it. And what yeah. is interesting was in the early days, it was slow and the calls would be dropped. Today, it, I have a GM account even today. It is the most reliable network in India. How did all this happen? What were the technical challenges that you worked on and what were the business challenges? And it seems to be a very profitable venture now. If you look at how most telecom companies uh, have launched 4G, they have been incremental. Uh, when is the last time you have uh, even part of a brand new, from scratch, new equipment, no legacy company come up in the US? Uh, not in uh, not in my memory. Uh, and here was Geo that took a jump with the technology with several uh, firsts, right? So it was, it was an all IP network with no legacy, no 2G, no 3G, no circuit voice. All all of the voice calls were voice over IP at a time when it was uh, it was not yet well known how to make voice over IP work over LTE, what is called voice over LTE. And uh, they they tried a new band that that had not been tried before, which was 2.3 gigahertz. So it was first time greater than two gigahertz, and hence you know shorter. Uh, uh, shorter distance and you know uh, quicker uh, decaying RF signals were used. And also um, that opened up a full set of uh, network design, network placement, uh, RF coverage, footprint understanding, and, and all of those sorts of uh, sorts of challenges. And now uh, imagine trying to trying to do this as a greenfield where at first, before you launch, you only have uh, 
a handful of uh, testers um, as your only load. And then you have to keep up with this load in a country as diverse as India with uh, all these you know, massively compact and uh, populated um, high-rise buildings and concrete structures in Midtown Mumbai to uh, areas with um, hills and uh, sparsely populated uh, villages all over and being able to keep up with this huge rise in subscribers. Uh, so they went from zero to 170 million within the span of seven months. But that is a pace that uh, no network had, had done before. Um, no scientists, I mean, not a Google, not a Microsoft, not a Facebook, nobody had come from zero to that level that fast. So this was, this was predictable uh, to an extent. Uh, and the reason it was so is because uh, we actually went through a lot of uh, modeling uh, and um, using various forms of data and various forms of machine learning. And then we actually built up a, uh, a platform um, that could ingress all of these data from more than 300,000 towers that you have put up. Uh, you know, you can imagine each tower had um, three sectors usually, and uh, each of those sectors would have three bands usually. So this is a massive number of networks and, uh, and each were collecting um, so many different parameters uh, from uh, RFS and R, signal energy, to number of connections, number of call drops and so on and so forth. And then uh, we applied a number of both modeling algorithms and then um, then uh, mechanisms to go and change those parameters, change those um, configurations on the fly so that uh, uh, it could go from uh, from state at which it, uh, it was to the most optimal state given the type of load it was facing. And by the way, as over time loads were changing, and so on and so forth, it could act just as some parameters that would keep the network alive and well and optimized um, in, a, in a way that is that's called SON, self-optimized networks. Probably the reason why you, uh, you, you saw this big difference in the, in the early ramp up days to, to the kind of steady state days is, 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 is just, a, just a natural um, settling time <laughs> For uh, for a uh, for for a learning system, right? All machine learning systems, by definition, learn the machine and uh, with the machine. And 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 I'm I'm glad to hear that uh, that things are uh, things are now at an acceptable quality. So I would say it, it is one of the uh, one of the things I, I I feel proud to have have been part of uh, because of the way it was built and the scale it was built and uh, and the um, uh, and not only the effort, but the but the technology risks that we that, that took. Um, I remember before Geo was uh, launched, uh, I saw a map. Um, won't uh, mention the company that showed me that um, uh, had this uh, you know um, colors on it about uh, the network connectivity all around the world. Um, uh, you know, four G was blue, and most of the US at the time was that. Three um, uh, G was green, which was most of Europe, and two G data connectivity, two G was red. Uh, and before Geo was launched, the bulk of India was two G. And um, and I said, you know, this map is going to change, and it did. So within a few months of uh, after WTO was launched, I believe that uh, at least for a while, uh, India held the title of the highest aggregate um, mobile data consumption in the world. Now, of course, uh, the population helped, but given that before that, it was at kind of like in the range of 130 or so <laughs> in the same stack uh, and, and going, uh, you know, going somewhere around south. Uh, it, it was a humbling experience to, to have uh, played my part in that. And honestly, uh, today India gives the lowest cost 
4G access, yep. uh, thanks to Geo. And the quality is amazing. So sp switching gears, uh, today I see issues with going from, first of all, adoption of 5G has been relatively slow. And 6G, people have all kinds of apprehensions about whether it's safe to use it, whether there's any value in it, are there any use cases? What's your opinion going from 4G to 5G to 6G? So, so first of all, 6G is not yet fully defined, right? Going 4G to 5G, there are a couple of different things that, is, that has happened, right? So one is from a protocol and a code network level, um, a lot of legacy is um, is kind of retired, so that does make uh, make it possible when the network is designed right uh, to get the lowest possible latency, which becomes so much more important when we are in this world of mobile to cloud seamless uh, use cases and and workloads and 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 that's. That's one of the biggest problem, big promise of, of 5G in, 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 in bringing that forward. Um, at the same time, uh, there's the other part of 5G, which is uh, going up in the, in the frequency charts, right? And of course, frequency with it brings uh, higher frequency, usually brings higher bandwidth. I mean, there is, there's that part of it. But then uh, in order to achieve that, you have to use this massive MIMO techniques of pencil beams and so on and so forth at the at the beyond six years. And that's where things start getting, um, uh, start making a difference between a properly designed um, system from an RF and scheduler perspective versus not. Uh, so you can very easily um, either, um, yeah, e either be able to provide a very good stable high speed connections or if something is not uh not configured and and, and optimized right can uh can easily isn't lead to a lead to a lot of props. Um I think there will be operators that would and, and, and these are areas by the way where adoption of proper AI and ML techniques can make the difference between one versus the other. Uh, I'm sure there are there would be operators that would be would be doing it great. Um, uh, am I par personally, you know, really happy with my own five G service? You know, uh, uh, back in California, um, I wouldn't say so. Uh, it can definitely improve, um, but uh, but that's a that's a learning process. I think uh, I think we'll um, you'll 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 see some. Uh, some um, you know the resources laggards, um, which may be uh, very different from from the old sort of um, the resources laggards uh, in the in the in the network quality game uh, that uh, that was common when uh, when you could have the lower lower frequency bands and just dominate with spectrum. Um, so so it'll be interesting to see that happen. Uh, the other promise of 5G, I would say, and this is, uh, this is a promise, this has not yet been realized, is what 5G can do in a, in a private network um, uh, situation. Um, although Wi-Fi has come a long way, uh, especially with Wi-Fi 6E, with, uh, with the 6 gigahertz band and all that, uh, Wi-Fi bands are congested and if nothing else, the new spectrums that 5G can bring in enterprise situations uh, does have a uh, real promise. And just like any other higher frequency um, technologies um, coming from outside, from a public network in, is more difficult than if it's deployed inside. So private 5G may, may in certain regions, in certain circumstances, uh, be also a game changer. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm a very happy user of 4G. Uh, not so happy about 5G yet in, uh, in uh, near the ocean when I live in Carmel. I'm now changing gears to Mintra. When Mintra was founded, and I still remember being, it was a young brand, 
Um, the idea that there was a need for an e-commerce company in a place like India for fashion and that to highly customize, um, I had serious doubts as a, as a person with a marketing and business development background that they would even survive. Uh, mm -hmm. But you guys did something, and I don't know what you did technically or from a business perspective, that Mintra became one of the darling brands of India in terms mm -hmm. of the e-commerce platform to the point where it was acquired by Flipkart, which was later acquired by uh, Walmart. Can you uh, give us your two cents worth as an insider when you were there? How, what happened and how did it succeed? You know, from the ecosystem perspective, there were a few things that, that came together. And then we can also talk about what made what we did in Mintra so much more unique and, and why, why it played into it. Uh, so in many ways, the Indian market was a curious study of some of the world's fastest uh, mobile networks um, in an age of very affordable uh, smartphones coming into a world where uh, infrastructures like the physical infrastructures were such that uh, uh, the type of retail experience that we grew up with with in this country, uh, you know, being just a just a hop and a skip away from uh, from your nearest mall, with uh, you know all the all the world's choices right in front, uh, was a novelty in India. There's no such thing as a as a quick mall run for for most people out there. So that uh, friction to uh, um, to brick and mortar retail uh, was probably a tailwind for 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 e-commerce. So, so you had odd combinations that when the, um, the benefits of globalization brought, um, uh, brought uh, fashion consciousness into the, the premium or mass premium sector, is, as we used to call uh, our target market in Mintra, uh, to the um, tier one, tier two cities in India, sometimes even in tier three, it also coincided with access to e-commerce with the associated uh, difficulty in uh, traditional brick and mortar retail for accessing the same thing. So you had a young aspiration driven generation with disposable income to spare and other exposure to the rest of the world coming to them through the internet that would want to actually make them a willing participant not and consumer in fashion happening at the same time at a time when uh, when e-commerce was actually way more affordable than uh, retail from if not from pure price at de def definitely from the total cost of uh, purchase perspective uh, so that I think drove it by a lot but the other part that Claudia's story behind it is we could not any longer create all of these customers at this one monolithic pole, right? Uh, gone were the days of, uh, you know, uh, one colored kutta and one colored hat or whatever it is. And uh, there had to be this personalization where you really had to understand the user. You really had to understand the taste. You had to understand from a few purchases and a few returns that they had made, what is it that, that you want to do? And this was made possible by a set of uh, pretty intense um, uh, re um, uh, recommendation engines uh, powered by ML, powered by AI, uh, in many cases with deep learning models like RNNs and stuff that, uh, that power them. Uh, to make things even more complicated though, especially for fashion, a lot of what people choose in fashion, you don't have it in structured data. You don't have it in a in a little uh, column in a database, so you have to make sense of it from just a catalog picture of what somebody bought, and this is where the other type of um, neural networks, CNNs, convolutional networks, uh, came into play. And uh, these were the early days of facial embeddings um, like DenseNet and others, and we really used them and modified them and did a lot of pre and post processing, which enabled us to identify the clusters that people were actually uh, getting tuned to that they were buying. And that helped just by itself in terms of 
what was out there in our uh, inventory to get to the customers. But we did not just stop there. What we did is we did something that at that time was unique and we were the fast movers in the fashion industry. We actually used generative AI to deliver fashion designs um, as a commercially delivered product. Uh, this was 2018, way back when we used GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, to actually generate designs that were similar, visually similar to the clusters of designs that were selling and that were training up. And without even the use of a human designer, we could actually generate uh, designs of that nature that would then be uh, pushed further uh, up into the, into the uh, manufacturing flow uh, to a point where uh, we could actually enable uh, the stocking of the shelves in, uh, in a fast fashion brand where once a trend has been detected uh, within four weeks or so, uh, there would be actual newly designed items that blended with uh, that particular trend uh, and was, was available for sale. Uh, with humans, this was only possible to do with a few months of um, delay from a trend coming up to, to when you had it. And because we could catch the trend early, uh, we could, as a result, sell more of the trendier stuff. And this was the first time that um, that generative AI in fashion, which we did, was commercially launched and it produced uh, more profit margin um, uh, percentage-wise compared to uh, what human designers could do in, in that particular space. So this is one of those things where techniques that were at that time novel, cutting edge, and never tried in a commercial setting, uh, blended together with this young, impatient, a very upcoming uh, mass premium market like India could, uh, could actually uh, see their value in. And uh, that was probably one of the reasons that at, at, at least contributed a little bit to its journey. Wow, I had I had no idea that uh, a lot of the designs were machine generated using Gen AI. I thought Gen AI is fairly recent, only two years old. So you actually were able to do some deep learning, understand using convolutional networks and put it to create new designs. I had no idea. That's amazing. No wonder Walmart was happy with the acquisition and uh, oh, all, all cool. power to them. <laughs> they could use it in many other products, not just in fashion. They could use it in any consumer product as well, I would think, right? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, this is this is one of the you know, lesser uh, talked about aspects of Gen AI. Uh, there is not just a gimmick, you know, not just, hey, I can... Uh, I can make a, you know, uh, make a fantasy image or I can, uh, I can, uh, you know, write my emails quicker or something like that. Uh, but there is tremendous value that once you uh, understand your, your, your core problems, you know, from the perspective of where are my customers, what do they need and how, how do I solve them in the fastest and uh, most accurate and most relevant possible way, uh, doors open uh, for generative AI uh, in increasing enterprise value substantially. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, and I hope, uh, uh, hope more of that happens. Indeed, indeed. Were you able to accomplish this kind of transformation in the travel space as well? Uh, yes. So um, in 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 travel, I uh, I headed the data science and AI teams, uh, all of them for a company called Agoda, which uh, was part of the um, Booking Holdings Group, the biggest online travel agency uh, in the world, and. Uh, uh, the the focus of Agoda was uh, was far more in the in the APAC world, and um, 
and uh, the the tra the and and specifically they they were heavily weighted towards uh, hotel uh, rooms like you know basically go to the uh, website or or uh, app and um, and find a find a hotel room that for a party for whatever duration you want uh, and uh, more and more into into um, also into Airbnb type of, of provided accommodation. Um, uh, it was called Agoda Homes and so on and so forth. So um, if you think about it, a platform that that brings together uh, providers of hotel rooms, yeah, hotels and, and chains like that, and, um, and uh, the consumers who come to rent them, in many ways, it's actually a quant company that happens to be in the travel industry uh, rather than a company like a Marriott or an American Airlines that actually owns all of the assets uh, on it, right? So, so the value of the company to a large extent depends on arbitrage. Uh, how well can you, um, can you, provide the best price at which you can maximize your profit and the best way in which you can uh, you can acquire your customers through programmatic uh, bidding and other other methodologies and in those two aspects um, uh, the algorithms or the techniques that uh, uh, that my team built in agoda were very much at the cutting edge in in the travel industry uh, but of course, we did not stop there. Um, we use what at that time were new techniques like reinforcement learning, one day and bandits, and a whole host of others in personalizing the experience. Uh, so there's a there's big difference between somebody in their 30s with, or 40s with little kids um, coming onto the app and looking to find a summer weekend getaway versus somebody um, who is uh, on a business trip, um, hopping from city to city and, and needing to quickly find and, and book a room in next to a, a business center or something like that. And how do you gear your experiences, the options that they see, the front-end experiences that they, that they go through in making their reservations and in going through the way in which they interact with customer service when they need to uh, in the most um, efficient possible way uh, with automated chart parts and other things. Uh, so overall, there were about 21 different projects that my teams worked on uh, and they produced uh, a very comfortable double percentage of the of the net profit that the that the uh, or at least gross profit that the company actually made out of it, so so in many ways AI was very fundamental to the uh, to the operations growth and uh, and the experience and the the, the brand experience of, of of the company. I had no idea how much. Font work goes on behind all these companies. Let me ask you about my favorite area that I worked in about half my career. Early on, you are involved both at Intel, Philips, Avenera, your own startup, uh, doing creating chips for various applications, particularly in DSP. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the challenges in bringing chips to the market or systems to the market? Yes. So. Um... You know, in many ways, uh, I kind of uh, saw this entire uh, this thing. I, I, I remember um, the early days of uh, CDMA, IS-95, and they were the latest and greatest at the time. And uh, people were trying to figure out, oh, how do I make a direct receiver on a, on a piece of silicon? And, and we did it and, we, uh, and, um, and brought them to market. And, um, you know, all these uh, long days of... Uh, going from an algorithm in MATLAB or something similar to Civilink and then getting it down to RTL and then uh, finally something comes up on an FPGA, then on a 
then on an essay they can then you know hooking it all up in the in in actual uh, test rigs and and repeating it so many times as uh, uh, chips never used to work uh, uh, the first time they would uh, they would tape out uh, and uh, and over time that that complexity um, you know uh, grew with uh, bigger uh, constellations of symbols and bigger and bigger channel codes and the the upper protocol stacks getting getting more complicated over time that so that that whole process i i would say there were these you know tw uh, tw twin challenges or uh, or, or uh, excitements right of uh, trying to get closer and closer to the channel bound the theoretical bound of how much bits you can push through nature and get uh, get the get the bits back and and how how you how you design your systems to to make make it possible right why uh, while at the same time also um also making it run on what was fundamentally a what is fundamentally a power limited system that has to run on a battery charge you know throughout the day and uh, both receiving and transmitting and and doing everything in between uh, from sleep modes to you know wake modes and how do you make the right trade-offs between how you do divide that across RF, across the signal, across the modern designs themselves, across the rest of the stack. So um, yeah, so those were those were those are fun times, and uh, probably if I if I look back on my fifteen or so parents, uh, a large number of them, probably the majority of them, actually came from from all of the signal processing uh, uh, work that I did at that time. Uh, I'm glad to have uh, you know uh, played my little part in extracting as many bits from the thin air that Mother Nature would allow me, <laughs> and, uh, and happy for that. Now back to the future, back to where you are today. You've been advising many companies on doing AI right. Can you get into it a little bit? What does it really mean to do AI the right way? Fundamentally, AI or machine learning deals with variables that are stochastic in nature, uh, where it's not actually the right uh, question as to you know what is the what will this variable come out to be? But the right question is more about what is the distribution of this variable? What is the probability that it will exceed this value or it will be fall, falling below this value? And that is not the way in which most uh, human thinkers, especially uh, ones who, who, um, who have to deal with more uh, deterministic reality, uh, you know, people in 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 the business end of things, or sometimes in the product end of things, are geared to think uh, because we humans, uh, our experience of reality is something either happens, or something does not happen. While the way we, uh, you know, mathematicians and statisticians and you know AI people look at things is, is not so much what a particular you know dice came up at a particular time, but what was the probability at which they could have come up with that particular value, right? And this creates a big gap today in terms of the business leader saying, okay, I have to achieve target X, Y, Z, and uh, and I want to you know see something built that helps me get there. And the language with which they, they define it, how do you then uh, translate that into the best uh, utilization of AI in order to answer that question. And a lot get lost today, not necessarily in the best algorithm that you can use, given an already well-posed ML problem, but rather how are you going to pose that problem? And as a result, what then flows down as the ML, the machine learning formulation of a business problem and hence, what kind of uh, techniques are you going to use? So that's that's one part where by engaging with uh, with business leaders and product leaders and going to the root of what they need to need to solve, we come out with solutions that uh, that actually give them 
what they themselves perhaps could not articulate in the right ML language. And, and, and that's one way in which we do AI, right? Uh, the other is ultimately all machine learning learned from data. And, and data is the is, is the is the fundamental oil which which runs everything. And not only all data is is created equal. And you know you can you can have you know thousand copies of the same document and try to train something with it. And it's no better than you know, using one <laughs> exactly one of them, right? The other is uh, just understanding the the data that an enterprise can have. Uh, which is slightly different from what they already have and what they can utilize and in what way, shape, or form, what should be utilized and what should not be utilized and how, as a result, you you create your AI, AI system to solve that enterprise problem. Of all. That's what we fundamentally do and that that's, that's who we are. And in the process, a lot of times, we actually end up with uh, even solving problems that were previously deemed unsolvable, like we are, you know, very, very close to cracking the code on how a particular type of medical um, imaging problem uh, can be can be amenable to a particular type of AI solution. And in those cases, we end up with what we call innovation and demand, where we actually innovate and 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 solve problems that have not been solved. And we don't just stop at this. Um, uh, strategy consulting, which was the first part, right? Going from business to, to ML solutions, not just, you know, coming up with, uh, new IPs of, uh, of previously unsolvable problem, but we also have our own ability to deliver, uh, AI use cases. Uh, so these three things combined, uh, are our, uh, core offerings to enterprises. And over time, uh, we do expect us to go into um, what we call customized products that um, that build on top of all these. Oh, innovation and demand, I really like that. And I guess you referred to precision medicine, personalization, customization, and all that. So I have a question about one of the things that has been bothering me quite a bit, which is human beings have a way of forgetting things that are unlearning things. For example, there were models of diseases in the past that was, uh, oh, cancer is always caused by external factors. But but now we know that certain types of cancers are actually caused by certain bacteria or uh, microbiome getting messed up. Is it possible for a machine learning or a a system that uses machine learning to forget uh, knowledge that is outdated and replace it with new knowledge? Is it possible to completely unlearn stuff and relearn with the right techniques? So it's possible. Uh, is it being done today? Perhaps not. It's not just that you can you can teach a machine to get positive reward when they give you the right answer. Uh, it is at the end of the day driven by uh, cost functions that you decide on, and so you can design them to give negative rewards when you get it wrong at, at a very micro level thing at which these things are done is for example if you think about how simian networks learn where you get a positive reward if there there are two things that are similar to each other and then you give a give a negative reward to train on when those two things are different from each other now you could potentially uh take a previously uh, trained model where you could um so for example uh, you, you know, you, you took all the world's um, information and trained an LLM and it trained on whatever uh, it trained on earlier, right? And now uh, there was something that came up and suddenly it says, oh, this is no longer the case. Um, so I don't know, let's say, uh, let's say somebody uh, figures out what dark matter is and then suddenly you have to now retrain it to say, oh, by the way, dark matter is not, you know, quote unquote dark, this is what it is, right? So it's no longer an acceptable answer that, oh, we don't know what this is. We actually know what this is and this is what it is, right? Now, how do, how do you do that? So one way is you throw everything away whenever every 
discovery happens and you go and start from scratch. That is just unfeasible, uh, given the pace of, uh, at which human civilization knowledge is growing. The other way is you actually create unlearning as part of your fine tuning. So don't look at LMs as a static being, which is unfortunately the way uh, we are seeing, a, you know, at least some of them being so, where, you know, sometimes they're like, okay, we have only tra trained ourselves till all the noise that we, there was till 2021 or some such thing. And yeah, um, you know, in our world, the world has stopped for, since then. We are even hearing things about, oh, let's not stop, you know, uh, training our, our learning models. We actually need um, to think in terms of uh, continuously updated models that stay on top of the world's knowledge and that can unlearn whatever uh, was uh, proven to be wrong and learn new things. So with with a combination of negative and positive learning feedbacks, uh, AI is not our enemy. AI is a tool, just like any other tool. We need to, we need to keep them updated. True, true. And if I were to ask you technical questions, I think a whole week will not be enough. So let me go to another question about your career. You've been an engineer, you've invented many things, you have many patents. You've also been an entrepreneur. You've been an executive and have run large teams, international teams. You've also been an advisor, especially more recently, not just a technology advisor, but also a management consultant. Which part of it have you enjoyed the most? And where do you see your own career going going forward? I have always uh, you know, partnered my technical missions in uh, in pursuit of of, uh, of of something that produces that. I enjoy solving problems that have previously uh, proved too vexing by bringing uh, not just new inventions but also uh, learnings and uh, ideas from very apparently uncorrelated fields together into an elegant whole that ultimately generates value. So, so value generation is what gives me a kick and especially value generation from uh, from solving uh, problems that have not been solved before. Uh, and that uh, naturally flows into taking uh, fundamental changes, fundamental improvements in uh, in technology and taking them into uh, into value generating uh, entrepreneurial ventures. So uh, with all the changes that are happening and it's almost a given, I think Sam Altman just said that there will be a few jobs that will be gone within the next few years. And there'll be many jobs, maybe 80% that'll get modified over the next several years. How should people manage their careers when there's so much transition it's causing a lot of anxiety for people also right. how yeah. do you young people who are just getting into the workforce what's the right approach how would you recommend people view the changes that are happening yeah so first of all ai is a tool and the the, the purpose like any other tool is to take the um, the parts that can be can be automated, can no longer need a human to do it, and 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 help us do those things far faster, far better, far cheaper, um, in a way so that we can actually live really, uh, you know, valuable and productive lives, and actually take back that time and use it in things that you know we humans are. Uh, are really on this art form. Um, you know, yes, uh, when uh, typewriters were invented, uh, a lot of scribes lost their job. But in the process, uh, humanity gained. And those scribes, uh, I don't think, were particularly unhappy because now they could use these typewriters to, you know, write new, uh, new novels and poems and... Uh, and and works of uh, of more practical value. If AI can take the boredom out of uh, you know writing very standard emails and documents and so on and so forth, uh, I for one would very much welcome it, right? And so would pretty much everybody else. If 
it can uh, take the um, uh, the 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 time it takes to put together a um, a slide deck or something like that. I mean, who would even you know say no to that? But if you if you took let us say a median work day, right? And if you looked at how much of that are things that we don't actually enjoy doing, that can actually be done with lot lesser time with AI today and what it will become in the future. Uh, because you have, to, you have to understand generating AI is still in its real infancy. And right now we are seeing only green shirts and, 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 and things that, that would hopefully happen down the line would make it really possible to take all of those uh, uh, all of those kind of you know mind numbing boredom out of a out of a median work day and minimize them to a lot and then think about what this person this median person can then do and how much value does that translate to and that is what we are looking at in terms of AI's impact on the GDP of the world and that is immense. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, Devrag, I thought I knew you well out of the last several conversations we had. Now I know that there's a lot more to learn from you. And I agree with you. We are just at the beginning. We are at the kindergarten level with generative AI and with deep learning, machine learning, and how the symphony of all these things can do things along with high-speed connectivity and all that. So we'll have to bring you back and learn much more, probably a lot more in the next few years. So uh, thanks again for joining us. And to everybody out there who's listening, I'm always looking for divergent views, different angles to the problems that we're facing and the opportunities that are in front of us. Uh, so please come forward. I would love to hear from you. And Debrak, thanks a lot. And uh, Wishing you the very best with Machine Animus and the many new ventures ahead of you. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you for your kind words and thank you for uh, inviting me to your forum. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Uh, it always is. And same this time.